This is an interview series called The Trade-Off, where we wrestle with all sorts of choices in personal finance. Today's focus is going to be on making sense of the rather dramatic investing climate of 2020. And to help us with that is Dr. Apollo Lupescu. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> you got it. Really good. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I practiced. But uh, Apollo, thanks for being with us. A little background on Apollo. He is a vice president at Dimensional Fund Advisors, uh, which is one of the premier investment management firms in the world. Uh, he's been communicating ideas in investing and Dimensional's research to both financial advisors and clients. Been working there for uh, 16 years and in, internally and maybe externally is regarded as the secretary of explaining stuff uh, which is exactly why he's with us today, because we need some explaining. Uh, Apollo received his uh, PhD in economics and finance from UC Santa Barbara. He has a BA from Michigan State, where he, he competed and coached in water polo, which I understand is a far more aggressive and violent sport than, it, than one, might, one might imagine. Is that fair? <laughs> That is fair. That is, that is fair. It's like, you know, <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, it's it, I think there was a saying that that football is, I, I'm not going to compare football and water polo, but, but uh, quite a lot of the uh, the football players were intimidated because um, it, it's so different when you play with no gear and nothing and you're just in the water, half the things nobody sees because it happens on the water. So, uh, so it is, it is, to me, it's comparable to a bit of football. <laughs> it's just a lot of time. I can only imagine. <laughs> Well, thanks for doing this. I've got, I've got probably five or six questions I, I want to talk with you about and get your insight. Uh, because there's so much going on this year, uh, there's never been a more important time to help people understand and think clearly about uh, investing in markets. So what I'd like to start with is uh, the, the reality that there's been a seemingly massive disconnect between uh, the stock market and the economy, most of us as investors have at least some perception that the what happens in the economy should inform us about what will happen in the stock market. And that doesn't seem to really have occurred this year with unemployment being somewhere near 15% at some point, GDP absolutely collapsing, and the stock market rebounding quite briskly. That d doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Right. Uh, can you help us think through this? Yeah, no, uh, and it's it's yeah, it is it is obvious. It's kind of staring us in the face. You look at there, the, the economy's not fully reopened, as you said, millions of people. How come the market's doing so well? Uh, because it doesn't seem uh, logical. And 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 to begin with, let me let me kind of just start with a broad statement that the markets and the economy are related. Uh, they end up eventually in the same place, but. Um, Perhaps think of a, a dog and a dog walker. A dog walker tends to be a lot steadier uh, and sometimes going faster, sometimes slower. Uh, and yet the dog on the leash tends to move a lot more, particularly like think of a small Jack Russell that kind of goes, goes over the place. So they are related, but they're not the same. They will end up eventually in the same place. It's just the economy tends to do it in a much more steadier way than the market does. Uh, but what we're seeing right now actually um, is, is quite interesting because um, what's been happening in the economy, and I think the brunt of this economic downturn and pain has been borne by smaller firms. And many, many of these firms are, are Main Street firms, which are not actually represented in the stock market. They're just not in the stock market. Um, so, you know, you have these local coffee shops and the restaurants and the small businesses. Uh, those are not part of the stock market. And through some really um, uh, twisted irony, uh, some of these large stock market companies might stand to benefit. Uh, if the local coffee shop doesn't make it and, you know, large national chain swoops and takes a location well they'll expand at the at the expense of the local one so in some way when you dig beneath the surface what you actually see is that seeming disconnect actually has a logic when you look at my own situation uh, I'm, I'm a business traveler and last year I took so many trips and I and I flew American and United and Delta and all these airlines they stayed in all the hotels all this stuff that's no longer there so these companies are taking a really big beating 
But on the other hand, there are companies that are doing well in the economy right now because I am shopping a lot more from home. Uh, I am using other things that I didn't uh, use before. Home Depot yesterday was in the paper uh, that even the, 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 the leadership of the company was surprised how well they did in the pandemic. So not everybody's winning, not everybody's losing. There is some logic to it. But the one thing, Kevin, that I'll maybe kind of uh, uh, mention two more things actually on this topic because it's such an interesting topic. The first is that when you see the market, you have to be a little careful of what you're measuring. There are three measures that you hear all the time. The first one is Dow Jones, the other one is S&P, and the third one is NASDAQ. They're all trying to measure the market, yet they're very different metrics. And when you look, let's say, at the S&P, which is considered by professionals to be the broader one, what you see is that you know through the end of July, it was up about 2% or so. So you're saying, well, the market's up for the year. Uh, uh, that was sort of through the end of July. But what's interesting is that if you look at the top five companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Alphabet, which is the parent of, of Google, these five companies together, uh, they return on average about 35% for the year because we are using a lot more of their products uh, and they amount for a little less than a quarter of the value of the S&P. So they have been doing really well and, and, and what I'm seeing is that they're really pulling a lot of others. If you look at the rest of the 495 companies in the S&P, they actually had a negative return for the year. It's just they're being driven down by these large technology stocks who are doing well because, again, we are using them a lot more, and this is reflected in the price. Uh, so not every company is doing well, uh, and the market, the way we measure it, has been really dragged up by these five companies, but not every company is doing uh, well. Um, and, and in fact, if you look at the smaller companies, which are in the market but not in the S&P, they're down over 10% for the year. Uh, so that to me is, is, is just kind of saying that, that when you dig beneath the surface, there is a reason why we're seeing this. But to begin with, the market and the economy, they are not supposed to be the same thing. Because the economy tells you about your paycheck right now. Everything that happens in the economy impacts your paycheck that you get today. Whereas the stock market is your paycheck from the future because you're buying ownership in these companies and you're gonna get paid as an investor, as an owner in that company for years and years and years to come. So in that big scheme, in fact, if you think about it, uh, there are companies that have been paying investors for over 100 years. And if you think, you know, how much the next one or two years matter when you can get paid 100 years and that's where the value of a company, that's where you see there's the time horizon of the economy and the market uh, is, is it could be another reason why we see this disconnect. Much as investors have intuitions about the economy and markets, investors also have intuitions about politics and markets. We have elections coming up. Right. However, uh, unusually quiet the uh, national election is compared to four years ago. It's coming up. Investors are beginning to form ideas. They have concerns. What does history tell us about any sort of trends that might be identifiable with elections and markets? Right. Um, well, to begin with, I think that, that, that uh, this particular election, I think probably the last one, but this one in particular seems to be more polarizing than ever. And, and I do think that, that it is um, something that touches not only on investing, but also on, on behavior. And actually what I mean is that not only on the technical analysis of investing, but the behavioral side of investing because there's so much emotion around the elections uh, that, that sometimes people get uh, excited about the prospects or, or terrified about the prospects based on their political views. Uh, and, and I think to some degree, this is touching on our core beliefs or identity as individuals. So, so certainly there's, there's a big emotion involved. I think that our job as investment managers is to really pay attention to those emotions, but ultimately disengage them from investment decisions. I think that's a really important piece. Uh, and I've seen this quite a bit, particularly at the end of the last cycle, when some people were really excited about it because they had voted for the current president. Some people were really disappointed. Uh, and and, and it, it was a hot had to do with the emotion rather than um, uh, rather than the actual uh, uh, you know analytical of, of the situation. So when you take a look, when you take a look at the numbers, uh, there are two or three questions that, that are worth answering. The first one is uh, because it's an election year. Uh, just because it's an election year, uh, does it make a difference for an investor? And should he make a move because there's an election year? Uh, 
The second one, when you look at the data, again, unemotionally, uh, does it make a difference if we have a Republican or a Democrat in the White House? And thirdly, it, even as policies change, what do we see their impact is, whether it's tariffs or taxes or whatever else could change, uh, how much does it impact the returns that an investor gets? Uh, so I'll try to quickly answer those, those three. Uh, and the first one, I'll, the, the one that I'll start with is, 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 is a presidential election. So when you look at the presidential elections uh, over the past, uh, um, you know, uh, I would say going back to 1926, that's as long as we have data. Uh, what we see is that in this period of, of over 90 years, um, we have had 23 different election years. And what we do know is that over this entire period of, uh, you know, of 90 plus years uh, examining the stock market, the average growth per year uh, over the long run has been around nine to 10 percent uh, per year. So that's the average uh, return in the market uh, when you look at the data, nine to 10 percent per year. The question is, for these 23 different election years that we've had so far, how much lower, how much higher <laughs> has the, uh, uh, the, the average of these 23 election years has been? And when you look at the data, what you find is that it's pretty much been spot on. Uh, it hasn't been vastly different at all than the long-term trend. So just because it's an election year, it doesn't seem to make a difference for the market. The average is pretty much the same. Now, the average is showing not only the good years, but also uh, might have information when things don't go well. So when you look at this, uh, uh, that is 23 different election years, and you ask, okay, how many have been positive where the market went up versus negative? What we see is that 19 out of the 23, the market went up, and only four out of the 23, the market went down. So the overwhelming, uh, the preponderance of the times the market went up in an election year, uh, but there are four times when it went down. And to that point, is there something that we can learn if we look at these four times when the market went down? And the first one, first time this happened was in 1932. And in 1932, uh, the market was down about 8%. But if you remember, 32 was also a year when we are still in the Great Depression. So we had an election, but also a Great Depression. Uh, and eight years later, once again, we saw a negative return in the market during the election. But there was also the year when uh, Germany invaded Europe, and it became clear that this is going to become a, a war. Uh, and it took six years until the next time we saw a negative uh, return, and that was 2000. But if you remember, that was when, you know, Pets.com and all the other dot coms uh, went bust uh, about the same time. Uh, and the last one, obviously, was the great financial crisis uh, of, of, of 2008. So it, it, if you look at the four times when the market went down in an election year, it seems that in every single case, there was something a lot bigger going on in the world than the election itself. And even, you know, let's say, knock on wood, that this is going to end up being a negative year. Well, I think 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, when we look back, we might just think of this negative year uh, being caused by the coronavirus <laughs> rather than the election uh, uh, itself. So in other words, if you look at an election year and say, is there something special? Should I be afraid because the market does something different? Uh, you know, what, it, what the evidence tends to show is that not really. Uh, I don't observe anything that is vastly different. Now, what about having a Republican or a Democrat? And for this, we kind of went back to 19, uh, to actually to my lifetime, because I'm born in 1969. Uh, and I, when I was born, President Nixon was in office. And for the five years that he was in, in, in office, on average, the market dropped about 3%. Now, those are the times of 1973-74 uh, when we had the big the, the oil embargo and, and, the, and the economic downturn. And then following it for three years or so, it was Gerald Ford when the market was up about 20%. And if you go through the different presidents and you ask, again, on average, what did the market do during the time that they were in office? What you see is that, that just, just as an observation, it doesn't seem to be obvious that the market responds better to one president, uh, one, one party or another. In fact, it's, it's all over the place. It doesn't seem to be obvious at all uh, what to expect. Uh, what we see is, for example, you have a, a very business friendly president, George W. Bush. Um, I happened to have one engagement with, with the gentleman, uh, with the president years and years ago, and he was very business friendly. And, and, and you know, from an investment perspective, there are cuts to dividend taxes and long-term capital gains, things that were supposed to help the market. And yet on average, during the 80 years that he was in office, the market lost over 4%. Should he receive blame for that? Absolutely not. 
he walked in just as the dot com was 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 going bust. Uh, 9/11 happened nine months into the term, and he walked off at the very bottom of the great financial crisis. So, uh, in my opinion, a president should receive neither credit nor blame. On the other hand, you have President Clinton, who presided over this tech boom. <laughs> that, talk about market timing. He walked off pretty much before, right before it went bust, uh, so he didn't catch much of it. So, so to me, again, it's not it's it's not a um, it's not something that that I would that I would say uh, would would matter that much when it comes to uh, 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 to the mar the return of the market. Now, the third question is like, does it matter if if you have policies that are you know deemed more business friendly or not? And again, I would go back to George W. Bush. He probably, from an investment perspective, he was um, uh, you know he was very busy. I remember. You know, just as I started at Dimensional, there there was this this big uh, tax cut that that uh, that investors were so excited about. Um, and yet again, it didn't work out very well. On the other hand, I remember a lot of investors being nervous when President Obama came into office, and they said, "Well, I remember a Newsweek uh, cover kind of saying we're all socialists now." Uh, and yet somehow, uh, the the uh, over the eight years that he was in office, the market went up over fifteen percent uh, during uh, President Obama. So I wouldn't. Be tied this too closely because ultimately the market is driven by companies and their their um, and and their results and what the companies do, how they make money. That's ultimately the driver of of their returns. And what matters more is the products. It's the it, the, the strategy, how they execute, what competitors do. That's a much bigger driver of returns in the market uh, than than who's in the White House. And to kind of illustrate the point, uh, not to make a political statement at all, but just looking at a policy that we've had for the last few years uh, to really support the domestic steel industry. And that is really supposed to help them. It's, it's something that, that it's supposed to help uh, uh, the, the U.S. firms. And in fact, if you look at the uh, company that carries <laughs> the name of the industry, U.S. Steel, and you ask, how do these tariffs uh, basically having a, a you know, really support of the U.S. government, how do they work out for the investor? Um, it's not really encouraging. There was a, there was a, you know, a, a jump up there just before the tariffs were imposed. Uh, on other uh, on foreign producers, but since then it's been a very clear downward trend in the value of that stock. Uh, so just because you know the the policy of the government was to support the steel industry, that doesn't necessarily translate uh, into into great success for for investors. So uh, so to me, uh, the ultimate answer is that I would look at the election. I'd be careful about the emotional side. But from an investment perspective, I don't think it makes any sense to change anything in your allocation because of the election itself. The, the direction of the volatility, uh, maybe it's a coin flip. Uh, what I'm wondering is an investor with a lump sum of cash to invest today who wants to get into the market, are they better off investing all at once or with the market environment having more potential perhaps for volatility, whether it's the elections, the coronavirus situation in general, are they better off considering a methodical approach to move their money into the market over time? Right. And perhaps should they, should they be concerned about buying more when there are dips in the market if they're to do that? Yeah. Um, so to begin with, I mean, I, I, I'll come back to the something that, that I find hugely, hugely important is that I think there is an analytical side to investing and there's a behavioral side to investing. And the two of them can really be untied because for an investor, they're, they're really one and the same. Uh, it's just really hard to pull them apart. Uh, so what, what I can tell you is that, that from an analytical perspective, an investor is better off investing the money all at once. Because when you look at statistics, uh, and this is the US market, um, roughly about, you know, in any given day, 53% of the time or so, the market goes up in any given day and 47% of the time it goes down. So on a daily basis, if you invest or not, it's a bit of a flip of a coin. But if you extend that to a month, what you see is that over 60% of the time, the market goes up, even after it reaches an all-time high, uh, and 40% it goes down. So statistically, if you stay out of the month for, uh, if you stay out of the market for a month, your odds are that you'll miss something good rather than something bad. 
Uh, and then if you extend that to a year, it becomes even more compelling that over 70% of the time the market goes up. So statistically, I think it's important to note that you're better off putting the money at work all at once. Uh, on the other hand, the behavioral side is basically uh, making you a little bit um, anxious and also it might create some remorse where if the market happens to go down the month that he put it, you just, oh, I could have done something else. So from a behavioral perspective, some people feel more comfortable putting in the, mar the money uh, in the market over, let's say, a period of six months. And if that gets them comfortable, if that is, is easing the behavioral side, if you're going to be invested for 10, 15, 20 years, whether you put the money to work in August or December, I don't think in the long run it will make much of a difference in, in, in my view. Uh, but your odds are better if you put all the money at work at once. And the last comment I'll make on this, Kevin, Quite a lot of people are kind of saying in their minds, like, I need to invest all at once. Well, what investors ought to have is a financial plan. And quite often in the financial plan, not all the money goes in the stock market. Some of the money might go into bonds. Some might go into uh, international. Uh, some might go into other types of investments. Uh, so, you know, it's not that every penny is being put in the market. Uh, so just to kind of like debunk a little bit, doesn't mean that every penny of yours is going to go into the Dow Jones or the S&P. Most often that's not the case. Your firm has done perhaps the most research on the concept of value investing. Uh, if, if not the most, you're, you're in the neighborhood. Right. The, uh, the concept being that if an investor systematically has a preference for buying uh, stocks that are relatively cheap rather than relatively expensive, there seems to have been a historical advantage in doing right. so. Right. For about the last plus or minus three years, it seems that the opposite has, has been the most rewarding strategy, which is to right. have preference for the most expensive stocks relative to uh, the cheaper stocks. And I'm curious if there, if, if there is any observation that seems compelling about a fundamental change in the preferences of investors, the way investors think about what they're willing to pay for a company, perhaps tied to the notion that high tech companies have zero marginal cost and intellectual capital that they can leverage. These are some of the ideas that, that I hear floated around. What has your recent research shown to um, unearth any discoveries about changes in this value investing factor or, or otherwise? All right. So value investing, Kevin, you kind of hit it, is, is, is really the idea that if you have two companies and you look at them and, and let's just define the word expensive, uh, basically how much are you paying uh, to get some sort of an accounting fundamental that you can measure today? And it could be earnings, it could be the value of assets after liabilities are paid, which is called book value. Uh, this is something that we use. Uh, it, it could be uh, uh, earnings, any number of metrics of the accounting that you can measure relative to the price that you pay for those. Uh, and probably the easiest to understand for a lot of investors is this, uh, is this idea of price earnings. That's not what we use, but just for the intuition purposes, just simply intuition, you can look and say, how much does it cost me to buy a dollar of earnings that's well publicized out there uh, for different companies? And I can give you an example. If you look at um, uh, Amazon, and this is, uh, you know, you can pull up your iPhone and look at, at something called the P ratio. What you see that, that, that for Amazon is over $100, which means that it, it costs you $100 to get one uh, a dollar of earnings from Amazon. Now, if you look at other companies, let's say Pfizer or Intel, which are large companies, uh, that price range might be 10 to $15. So the belief that we have is that, that if you're paying a lower price, uh, that uh, it might end up uh, giving you a benefit. It's like two houses on the same block. <laughs> One sells for $100 a square foot, the other one $500 a square foot. If you're going to look to buy and flip these houses, which one gives you a great opportunity? Well, you know, the, the lower price one tends to be a, a, perhaps a, a, a way to go. So that's kind of the idea of value. I don't believe that anything has changed because the reason that these companies have a lower price is there is a reason the market is finding that, that to some degree, these companies might carry in some way less certainty. They're not the polished remodeled house that costs a lot of money. Maybe these houses need some work. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that's why you see there's a difference in price. Um, and this is a, a fundamental premise of our 
world, not even on our investment, is this idea that their risk and return are somehow related. And the reason that these companies have a lower price is that there's something more uncertain about them. And whenever you have something more uncertain, well, you have to give me a bit of a higher return. That applies in the way we get credit cards and mortgages. Not all of us pay the same interest rate on mortgages or interest rates on credit cards. Some of us pay a lower interest rate, and I'm not sure I'm one of them. <laughs> I'm not punning myself, but I know that some people pay a lower interest rate because they're a better credit risk. Others pay a higher end. The value companies tend to be the ones that, that pay a higher interest rate, in, in, in a, if I were to make an analogy. So, uh, if that doesn't work anymore, the companies that are a bit riskier are not supposed to pay uh, a, a higher interest rate. Well, we have a lot bigger issues in the world because that, that is a fundamental premise of our world. And I don't think that has changed at all. I think it's exactly the same. Now, to follow up, when you look at the numbers, do we see that something like this might have happened in the past? Or is this the first time that we see this and perhaps we think of this uh, uh, change in paradigm? Uh, and when we looked at this in the past, and, and in fact, we did analyze this uh, even beyond, um, you know, even beyond uh, 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 basically, um, uh, you know, one year or three years, what you see is that, that if you look at the value uh, in particular, if you look at the value uh, uh, stocks, uh, what you see is that over one year, about 60% of the time, they actually end up outperforming growth. And what it means is that 40% of the time, roughly, over 40% of the time, growth actually outperforms. So there's nothing really unusual over one year for that to happen. Even if you go to five years, it becomes 73%. But even then, about you know more than three uh, out of one and four times, growth still beats stocks. And sometimes even over 10 years, it doesn't mean that it happens every time. So this has absolutely happened in the past. We see in the data, there's nothing really unusual about having value with a period of underperformance. Um, but what we see ultimately is that after all these periods, uh, the, the you know um, value does come back. Now, to, to answer the last part of your question about has anything changed because we have these large dominant companies and because we have these large dominant companies, maybe the world is a bit different. Maybe having them and, and they don't have as much uh, assets or they many assets, they don't have as much infrastructure and so forth. Um, and they're going to be the dominant ones going forward. Should we maybe focus on them? And we've looked at that as well. Uh, and, and what we see is that, 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 that um, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, largest companies in the U.S. market over decades, and you start at the 1930s when we have good data, uh, and you take what are the largest companies in the, uh, in the U.S. economy, uh, what you see is that these large companies, take AT&T, it was the, 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 the largest company uh, going from the 30s, and it was in the top four all the way into the 90s. Seven years it was there. Uh, so what it seems to indicate is that the companies that do end up uh, becoming large, they do stay dominant. Uh, and, uh, um, and it's the same. You have General Electric that was there for 90 years, which is remarkable how long a company can actually uh, uh, stay uh, as a top 10 company. Uh, but, you know, there are a few things that I would that I would say are important for people to understand is that the first one is that you're absolutely going to have these companies as part of the portfolio. If it's well diversified, you're going to have them. You're going to have others uh, around them as well. And why is well, there are a few reasons. The first one is that whenever you get this big, you tend to invite some scrutiny. And, and we've seen recently <laughs> all these uh, the heads of the big families kind of going and testifying uh, over Congress. Uh, the second one is that they get very expensive the larger they get uh, because they become more secure. So it, it, it's actually the, it, when it comes to valuation, they might not actually be great investments, uh, great buys. But the third reason is that once a company gets to the point, they might be dominant. But the question is, are they also great investments? And when you look from that perspective, once they hit you know, the top 10, once they get up there in the top 10, over the short run, over three years, uh, we do see that they tend to outperform a little bit relative to the market. This is the performance relative to the market. So over three years or so, uh, they do give a bit of a, a, a kick relative to the market. But at some point, what we see is that somehow they run out of steam. It's harder and harder for them to grow. How easy is it for Facebook or Amazon to double in size? Um, and what you see over five years, they actually underperform the market. Uh, by over 1% on average. And when you look at the 10-year numbers, they significantly underperform the market. 
So it doesn't mean they're not dominant. They might stay dominant. But you, what you see is that, that they no longer actually uh, provide the same returns as before they join uh, this, this top 10 list. Uh, so it, so it's, 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 I think it's an interesting idea that it's uh, once you get up there, you might be dominant, but it might not be a great uh, investor uh, performer. You might want to find the next Amazon, the next Facebook, uh, because the great returns are up to this point. So I'd be cautious. Like that worked out great. They were part of the portfolio. What's next? Let's just not get stuck in the past. Apollo, I've asked you a lot about stocks. My final question is about the safe money. Right, right. Interest rates on cash near zero, on treasury bonds, one, two percent. Net of inflation, if inflation is even two or three percent, right. we are barely keeping pace. Uh, how how do you instruct investors to think about safe money, particularly a, a retired person who is expecting to need withdrawals over over the next several years? Right. Um, I mean, I'll have a, 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 a few answers. It's a really good point, and I kind of we touched on this: the importance of a financial plan that enables that is able to balance the trade-off of investing, and, and the fundamental trade-off is stability versus growth. And and just to kind of put some bonds in context, uh, if you look at the um, the U.S. stock market, and we talked about having an average growth of about nine to ten percent per year. This is the S and P five hundred. Uh, and over the long run, going back to the 1920s, what's interesting is that if that's the annual average from year to year, it looks something like this. A lot of choppiness in the stock market. So even though that's the average, I'm not aware that the market basically delivering the average, the exact average in any one single year. So there's a lot of movement, a lot of choppiness around the average. So uh, that's what that's when most investors get the growth by owning pieces of companies and the growth being at nine to ten percent and just to make it real my dad is born in 1926 that's when he started having good data and I was curious well what would a dollar invested in the US stock market ha have grown to in his lifetime uh, by the time he turned uh, 92 he's 93 about to be uh, 94 uh, and and we have this book called the matrix that it's one of the, the, the most remarkable investment books that there's a big book of numbers, <laughs> encyclopedia of numbers. And what you see is that, that uh, a dollar invested in the S&P uh, was a little bit over $9,000 in growth. So a significant growth that comes from the stock market. And that's kind of what the role of the stocks is, is to give uh, the portfolio kicker and, and a growth. It's a remarkable number, $9,000 growth in, from $1 in my dad's lifetime. Now, you mentioned bonds. Bonds are basically a way where you lend money and you know exactly the interest trade that you get for how long because we have a contract with that. Uh, and if you had, let's say, you have lent your money to the U.S. government in the form of a 30-day treasury bill, which you only get the money for 30 days, you get the money back plus interest. Over the past 93 years, there has never been a single calendar year when you would have lost money. Never. So it's very, in, in terms of like opening statements at the end of the year, you're not going to open it up and say, well, I lost money. Uh, at least historically, that hasn't been the case. Uh, and a lot less fluctuation in value, a lot less volatility uh, in, in these treasury bills than the 30-day treasury bills in the stock market. So having some of the safe money is good, uh, but the trade-off is that you don't make as much. Instead of 9%, 10%, you make something in the order of 3 to 4%. Uh, so this is a very important decision and to, the different roles for the bonds, but one of the primary uh, roles that you have bonds in your portfolio is because you want to uh, have some stability, particularly as you get to a point where you don't have the stability of a paycheck coming every two weeks, uh, which is what happens in this unpaid vacation called <laughs> retirement. Um, and the other good news with these treasury bills is that uh, the bogey that you have to hit is inflation. Historically, inflation has been about 3%. These have paid you just a little bit more than inflation. So bonds are, are a really good way uh, uh, to, to, to do this and um, uh, to give you that, that, that stability in your portfolio. Now, just to make it apples to apples, uh, a dollar invested in <laughs> the, uh, the same asset class over the same time period, and I invite the audience to kind of guess a number, what would the 9,000 become if you invested 3 4% instead of 910. Well, that book of numbers kind of tells us it's a whopping $22. Uh, and that's a very big difference. So in other words, the bonds in a portfolio were not 
ever really designed to be an engine of growth, but more stability. And even with these low interest rates uh, that we've seen, the bonds have provided exactly that. So the role of the bonds is not to give you that much growth or even income in retirement uh, per se, but rather kind of be uh, something that cushions, particularly when the stock market goes down. And this is exactly what we've seen historically. If you look at the, uh, even like at, at, through the end of April, uh, that's when the last time I updated this, um, the market was down uh, uh, about 10%. Uh, 9.3 percent, but this these government bonds were up for the year. So in that in that respect, the bonds are doing their job even in a low interest rate environment. Um, and and more so, is this the first time we see it? Well, over the past 20 years, every single time when the market went down significantly, uh, once again, the bonds actually uh, held up really well, which is what you want, that seesaw movement uh, between stocks and bonds. Uh, so even with these low interest rates, one of the main uh, uh, roles that the bonds have is to provide some stability and a cushion against uh, a potential market downfalls. And that's what we've seen so far in the evidence and the data. Um, and, uh, and in that respect, they're still doing their job. Now, it's also possible, not to mislead anybody, it's also possible that when the market flies high, like we had in 2013, uh, then the bonds could lose a little bit of value. Uh, but a bond loss in value is not nearly as dramatic as, um, as, a, as a loss in the, uh, uh, in the stock market. And last but not least, to kind of fully answer that, Kevin, is that not all bonds are the same. So I've used the U.S. government bonds. Uh, because that's kind of what you see most often. Um, and again, this is as the last time I pulled these numbers, uh, you wouldn't get paid as much in, in um, over um, uh, 10 years. There's a 10 year bond uh, in the US uh, uh, treasuries, uh, but th they're not the only bonds and there is a relationship between what you get paid and, and, and you know, potentially the risk of not receiving what you're promised. Uh, so if you don't, if, if you want a lot of stability, then the U.S. government bonds, they tend to do a, 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 you know, quite a good job, at least historically, uh, when you look at the data. But if you want to buy, you can get Apple. And Apple issues bonds, and you get paid twice as much, more than twice as much <laughs> in interest from Apple bonds. Uh, because, you know, the investors perceive there is a little chance that over the next 10 years, you might not get paid back in these Apple bonds. Um, and, you know, it goes from there. Clorox, which we all know that <laughs> it's something we'll use for years and years, can issue bonds and, 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 and pay only 1.8% in interest over them. Uh, but then if you really want more um, yield as an investor, you could go to Starbucks and you get 2.4%. Four uh, percent, and then you can go even further to Southwest Airlines uh, and get over five percent uh, in these bonds. And if you really want to push, you know, you can go to Nordstrom and get eight and a half percent for these ten-year bonds. Uh, so it's not that all bonds are paying the same thing. It really is 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 something that is related to the risk. Um, but you know, ultimately. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, the, 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 what you get paid in bonds, you have to remember that, it, that, that a lot of it has to do with keeping stability in the portfolio. And that's something that the bonds have been doing and they are continuing to do. Apollo, it is now completely clear to me why you are often referred to as the secretary of explaining stuff. Uh, you have developed a world-class skill set in doing this and we all benefit from it. I really appreciate you doing this with us today. Thanks so much. It's been a great fun talking to you, and uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in and, and watching this video. Take care, Apollo. Thanks. Bye-bye.